Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to LifePoint Church. My name is Andy, and I'm the lead pastor here at LifePoint, and we just want to say welcome. If this is your first time joining us, whether it's in person or online, we just wanted to say that we are excited to be able to worship with you. In fact, we would love to hear how you heard about LifePoint. So if you're with us in person this morning, in your seat back in front of you, there's an information card. If you're joining us online, there's a connect link. We would encourage you to pull that card out, click that link, fill out the card, let us know how you heard about LifePoint. Let us know how you can get, how we can help you get connected to our church. And let us know if you have any questions. Now, after the service, if you take that card downstairs to one of our connect cards, you can exchange it for a free welcome gift. Now, of course, for everybody, you can use those cards to let us know how we can be praying for you. We count it a privilege to do so each and every week. Also, if you're a regular attender, we want to invite you to give. Give to our general fund or to our building fund. If you have a gift for us this morning, you can leave it in one of our black boxes upstairs or downstairs, or you can also give online at azlifepoint.com. Now, I want to do something a little bit unique, a little bit fun this morning. I want to wish each and every one of you a very Merry Christmas. Now you might think I'm a little bit weird here, but if you know anything about LifePoint, you know that we love Christmas and we take every opportunity that we can to celebrate. So it's July, Christmas in July. Not only that, but I'm here in Canada and we have these things here called trees. And a lot of them look like Christmas trees. We also have a theme park here in Canada called Santa's Village, a theme park built around Christmas. In fact, all over, there's little tiny Hallmark type villages with year round Christmas stores called Christmas Time. So we wanted to do something special. We wanted to do a Christmas July gift exchange. So here's what we're gonna do. If you give us the gift of a review, we're gonna give you a gift of Starbucks coffee. So all you have to do Go online, go to Google, go to Facebook, leave us a review. We'll get a notification and we're going to mail you a Starbucks card. So it's a little Christmas in July gift exchange. Well, today we're going to continue our series going through the Beatitudes. And Pastor Trevor has a wonderful message for us this morning. But right now, if you would, would you join me? Would you stand up as we prepare our hearts to worship, as we prepare our hearts to be transformed by the good news of Jesus? Good morning, everybody. This seems like a busy harbor there that he's at. We're excited to to worship with you this morning. John? Capo 2, okay. I just want to make sure I'm playing it in the right key. Well, let's sing together. And are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all that's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you.
care that much about me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Oh, He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that He can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Shout, hallelujah. 
going to read a verse from Hebrews before we sing this next song. Chapter 13, verse 15. It says, Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. And there's a lot of songs that have numbers, right? There's 10,000 reasons, and um, there's a couple more, and of course I'm blanking because I'm standing in front of you all. But this song's called The Thousand Hallelujahs. And it's not that like we sing a thousand and then we're like, cool, done. Uh, it's just the idea of you're in the habit of continually praising. In the first verse, it talks about how the, the rocks would cry out if they had voice. And, and we're not God's only creation. There's the, the mountains and the trees and the, and the animals, but we're the only ones that get to vocalize this praise to God. And so the idea of this song is to continually sing praise uh, to our Lord. So this is a, a new one, and we, uh, we hope that maybe you'll catch it the first time and sing along with us.
We have a full stage up here today, so I have to put my guitar off the side, which is really lovely. It's nice during the summertime to still have folks here and available to, to worship with us. So, um, Good morning. If you don't know me, my name is Dan. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, just really thankful that you're here with us this morning to worship. As we do normally at this time, we're going to pray for the church of the week. And uh, that is uh, Mountain View Baptist Church. And uh, they've asked for prayer because they're, uh, they've got a time of an interim pastor right now and they're on a senior pastor search and they're just praying that the right candidate would find them and they would find him and it would be all for God's glory. So if you think about that this week, just pray for Mountain View Baptist just over here. Uh, funny enough, my uncle went there when I was a kid and I went uh, like summer camp with them one year. So uh, it's weird to always have connections to the church of the week. Just, I guess my parents just dropped me off a lot of places during the summertime and said, we're sick of you, go here. Uh, so maybe pray for that too. Um, but let's pray together. Dear God, we just thank you for an opportunity to, to worship and to sing hallelujah and to, um, to attempt to put into words what you've done to us, what you mean to our lives, the hope that you've given us through your son, Jesus Christ. God, uh, may we get in that pattern of continual praise, of praising you for, for what you've done, who you are. Lord, we lift up our friends over at Mountain View Baptist Church, and uh, God, they're in a time where... They're looking for somebody uh, to lead, uh, lead pastor. And so would you um, go before them and, uh, and, and, and inspire some, some candidates to apply that, that would be right for that position, God? Uh, would you just bless that search and the people that are looking? Would you guide them as they, they look through um, applications and resumes? It can be uh, hard and confusing and hard to really know people based on... Um, videos or a resume. So God, would you um, clear that confusion and then bring the right person forward? Lord, we, we lift up uh, our church as we uh, continue to uh, embark on our building campaign and uh, as we hopefully uh, break ground this fall. God, would you just be in those details as well? Uh, and uh, God, continue to use uh, the staff, the community, the volunteers, everybody here in Life Point Church to, to build your kingdom, all for Jesus. It's in your name we pray, amen. Uh, just have a, a couple of announcements this morning. The one is the next Meet Me At is uh, on July 13th, and it's at the zoo. You may have seen the picture of the tiger eating a child. We promise that will not happen at the zoo. Um, apparently, it's pretty frowned upon to climb the cage and get in the tiger's. And they've got some good restrictions to make sure you don't do that. Uh, so 
<clears throat> July 13th, the zoo, meet out front, 7.45 to 8. You don't have to let anyone know you're coming, but if you're there between 70, 7.45 and 8 a.m., Stacy and a group from LifePoint Kids will be down there, and you guys can all hang out and w walk the zoo together, and it should be a fun time. They've redone, uh, I always want to say pelicans, the flamingo area, and it, it's right now at the front, and it's really cool, and it's, I don't know. I like the zoo. <laughs> They're my people. Uh, and then uh, also on July 13th that evening, if you have a student between uh, 6th and 12th grade, uh, there is bowling. They're going to meet at Fiesta Lanes and bowl from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Would you email Trevor and let him know if your student plans on coming? And it's, uh, it's spelled perfectly, T-R-V-E-V-E-R, -E -E just for attention, and uh, at azlifepoint.com. And the last announcement is that uh, our women's uh, small groups, our life groups, uh, actually have put on a, a women's retreat on July 30th here in this building. And uh, uh, our friend Elisa Medina uh, is going to come and, and speak. It'll be a time of worship. It'll be 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, uh, lunch will be provided. So would you just email Lori at azlifepoint.com? She's even wearing her name tag that says, I am Lori at azlifepoint.com. And uh, let her know, uh, ladies, if you plan on attending. And uh, now we're going to continue our Beatitudes series from Pastor Trev. I was, I was thinking that uh, uh, during that video message from Andy that, yeah, he might be in Canada where the weather is so perfect that you get to set a nice fire in the evening. But we have monsoons. We have watermelon EGs. We have watermelon EGs. And snowbirds are gone. So we have many things to rejoice in this morning. <laughs> Enjoy being somewhere else the next six months, snowbirds. Please come back to LifePoint if you're one of those people. <laughs> Someone's watching online, they're like, I'm a snowbird. <laughs> I'm there six months out of the year. We love you still. Uh, if you have your Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. And if you don't have a Bible, that's okay. You'll be able to follow along on the screen. I'm I'm going to be honest, whether it's uh, this morning or it's next Sunday, uh, the next few passages that we're going to be covering uh, are pretty difficult. Uh, they're pretty, pretty hard to uh, sort of work through because what these passages are going to do is it's going to cause us to self-evaluate. And so as many of you guys know, we're going through the Beatitudes, and we've titled this series Transformative Truths uh, because the Beatitudes reveal to us what it looks like for us to be transformed by the good news of the gospel and what life in the kingdom of God looks like. And so the Beatitudes are just godly characteristics that make up the good life. The word Beatitude means blessed or happy. That's the best way that we can translate it in the English language, but there's actually a lot more to that word. Uh, a blessed life is more than just a, a temporary or circumstantial happiness. It's not based on anything that we have done or that we have accomplished. The blessed life is a state of well-being that is in relationship with the triune God. And so our reward is life with the king in the kingdom. And these eight sayings uh, from Jesus, they show us what it means to live a humble life and to live humbly like Jesus. And they reveal to us uh, the heart of a true disciple in Jesus. So we're gonna, as I said, start in Matthew chapter five, verse one. And <clears throat> we're going to read along, and I know this is going to start getting repetitive as we do it today, we do it next week, and we'll do it the week after, but I really enjoy going through the Beatitudes because they just are, are really fun to read and easy to remember. So here's what it says in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. It says, seeing the crowds, he, he being Jesus, went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Finally, blessed are those uh, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we come before you and we just ask that you help us uh, and just teach us 
more about yourself through your word. God, help your, your word this morning to challenge us and convict us. Help us um, in our pursuit to become more like you, Jesus. We love you, God, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the first week, we looked at the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet before the Passover meal. This was right before he was betrayed, wrongfully accused, and crucified on the cross. In Jesus' final moments, Scripture tells us that Jesus showed uh, those whom he loved, he showed them that he loved them till the very end. <clears throat> and so in Jesus' final moments, Scripture tells us and Jesus shows us what it means to love and to serve and to do so humbly. He served his disciples by washing their feet, which was something that a Jewish person just did not do, let alone a rabbi or the Messiah. And so Jesus did this to set an example for his disciples and for us. This is how we are to love others, serve others, and live humbly. And as I said last week, we're not going to be going through the Beatitudes verse by verse. Instead, what we're going to do is kind of be breaking it down differently. So last week we talked about uh, in verse six, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. That was uh, in the, the heart of Jesus' sayings. That's right about in the middle. And so this is going to anger, uh, anchor our series. And as we discuss, in order to hunger and thirst for righteousness, first, our faith needs to be placed in Jesus. And through him, we will receive a new heart. And not only that, but God also gives us the Holy Spirit as a helper. And so we can't live out these transformative truths unless we have been transformed by the gospel, which means declaring that Jesus is our Lord, our Savior, and our Messiah. Because the reality is we are born sinners. Naturally, our desires are not to know God, and they're not to recognize God as the triune God and the creator of all things. But now that we are in Christ, we have been given godly desires Yet the problem is they're still at odds with our flesh. The new has come and the old is passing away. Every day we live in the presence of God. Every day we are becoming more like Jesus. Every day our souls hunger and thirst to be holy and righteous like our Savior. Our new heart longs to know God, longs to worship God, longs to serve God, longs to glorify God and to make God known. These are the new desires that we have. And when we fail in these areas and we fill that hunger and thirst with things that are not of God, what's so good is that what holds the Beatitudes together is God's grace. God's grace holds it all together. So even when we fail, God gives us another opportunity to live out these truths. So this morning, we're gonna focus on verses three and seven. We're going to focus on what it means to be poor in spirit and to inherit the, the kingdom of God and how that leads us to be more merciful people. But I wanna start off with a story. I've been in ministry for a decent amount of time now and one of the things uh, that I love but it rarely happens is when somebody actually shares something with me that they are struggling with, probably because they're afraid that then I will mention it in a sermon. Um, don't worry, I give it a few years and I keep it discreet. But... I remember this one time, this young man asked to meet with me. And he's a really great young man. He loves Jesus. He's very smart. Uh, he leads in different areas. He was leading at that time different areas in our church. Uh, he was always willing to serve. He just was a, a really great young man, so much potential, and just so fun to be around. Just a really great guy. So we met up, and whenever someone asks me, like, hey, can, can we get together? Can we talk? I'm a narcissist, so I think it's like I've done something wrong or they need to talk to me about something that, I, you know, that I've done wrong or I'm doing wrong or that I said wrong or whatever. But that's not why he wanted to meet. I'll never forget, we were sitting across from each other. Uh, we got together and you could tell like he was very uncomfortable and he began uh, to share with me his struggles with pornography. He gave me kind of a brief history of how he was introduced to it and how he's been struggling with it on and off over the years. And I just remember him saying, I just need help. Like, I just need help. I can't keep living this way. I, I don't want to live this way. I know that this is not the life that God has for me. And he asked me, he said, hey, would you help me and be my accountability partner? Will you help me by encouraging me to be more consistent in my walk with 
the Lord? Can you be a safe place where if I do fail or fall, I can come to you and I can confess those things to you? Because he said, I hate that I give into this sin so often because I know it's not what God has for me. Now, that, that might not be a very impressive story to some of you because you're like, yeah, you're in student ministry. Of course, that story comes up. Uh, but I've, I've led a, a, lot of young, a lot of young men, whether middle school, high school, college, I've led uh, adults. I've met with tons of students outside of midweeks. I've led tons of life groups of every stage of life. And I can only count on a handful of times when someone pulled me aside, a young man pulled me aside or a man pulled me aside and he just laid out his sin for me and just confessed it and just like, you could tell it was really, really like having an impact on him. And, and, he, and not, not only that, but just saying like, hey, I just, I need help, right? Nobody forced him to, it's not like he got caught. He just did it because you can tell that that sin was really tearing him up. You see, when it came to the sin of this young man, he didn't blame it on anything or anyone. He didn't blame it on family issues. He didn't blame it on his friends for showing him porn at a young age. He didn't blame God for not bringing a girlfriend uh, into his life. He didn't pass blame or shift responsibility. He took responsibility for his sin, for his actions, for his thoughts. He owned it and he hated it. And he so badly wanted to overcome it. And he knew that only God could help him overcome it. The reason why I share that story is because this is what it looks like to be poor in spirit. Again, this young man uh, like came to know the Lord at a very young age and grew up in the church. Has a, he had, a, and it does have, a great relationship with the Lord. And you can see that in the fruit of his life. But being poor in spirit doesn't mean someone who is lacking materially or physically. It also doesn't mean someone who is shy or nervous or cowardly. It is a character trait that we call self-acknowledged weakness. It is the realization that we are nothing without God. And to be poor in spirit is to know one's spiritual neediness, especially our sinful nature. Being poor in spirit is someone who is completely destitute and helpless to do anything about their sinful condition outside of Christ. It's not the sins of society that concern a person who's poor in spirit, but their own sins of selfishness and pride and jealousy and envy and anger and those of us who struggle with being judgmental. You see, the Apostle Paul wrote this in 1 Timothy 1.15. He wrote, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Notice that this was towards the end of Paul's life when he wrote this letter to his young protege, Timothy, as he was leading a church. And notice that Paul didn't use past tense. He didn't say, I was. This is a man who was an apostle, who was starting churches, who was writing letters that would later go on into scripture. He didn't say, I was, or I used to be. He said, I am. For Paul, poverty of spirit was a continuous self-assessment. To be poor in spirit is the opposite of what we find attractive in the world. In the world, what we find attractive and what we admire is people who are self-reliant, right? Self-confident, self-made people. We love rags to riches stories. We love stories where people overcome the odds. We love the uh, perseverance of the human spirit, right? We recognize that any strength, but that's that's not what it means to be uh, a disciple of Christ. It's not what it means to be poor in spirit because we are none of these things. We recognize that our strength, our, any wealth, any notoriety, any gifts all come from God and his grace. And so luckily for us, Jesus gives us a picture also in the scriptures of what it means to be poor in spirit. If you do have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 18, verse nine. If you don't, it's okay, it'll be on the screen. But here's a story in the scriptures in a parable that Jesus tells. And here's what the scriptures say. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all that I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven 
but beat his breast and said, and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. So in this short parable, there's these two characters, the Pharisee and the tax collector. Both of these uh, men come to the temple. Now it would have been normal for a Pharisee to go to the temple and pray, but his posture is different than anybody else. The way that he approaches the temple is different than everyone else. First, he's standing, which is not uh, how Jewish men often approached prayer in the temple because the temple was, right, a holy place. It was where God dwelled. Second, while standing in a prominent place of worship, he was not near anybody. And so as we can see, the, the Pharisee's prayer is completely focused on himself and his own goodness. He mentions himself five times in his prayer. He mentions that he gives more than a tenth of his income. He mentions the fact that he fasts twice a week, which back then you only had to fast. Uh, in Jewish culture, you had to fast only one time out of the year during the Day of Atonement. In, in essence, the Pharisee is saying, God, I need nothing from you. I don't, I don't have any needs. I don't have any wants. He was falsely confident in himself. And rather than thanking God for what God had done for him, the Pharisee arrogantly brags to God about his own moral purity and righteous piety. The Pharisee looks down on his neighbors, including the tax collector, and he says, thank you that I'm not like him. And he says in his prayer, thank you, God, that I'm not like this tax collector. Now, I know that that's not how we pray, right? When we go before the Lord, we're often not praying in these ways. Uh, we're, not, we're not saying like, oh, I'm glad I'm not married to that person, or I'm glad I'm not like a leech uh, like that person or a bum like that person. That's not how our prayers are, right? But that's how our thoughts can be. Our thoughts can be, I'm glad I'm not married to that person. I'm glad I'm not a bum like that person. I'm glad my child isn't difficult like that. I'm glad that I don't drink as much as them. I'm glad that I haven't made poor investments like that person. You see, we may not pray that way, but if we're honest, we have thoughts that are like that, that creep in where we think that we're better than somebody else, which is what the Pharisee is struggling with. And then there's the tax collector. The tax collector, a tax collector back then rarely, if ever, entered the temple. Like they, they never, ever went into the temple because tax collectors were Jewish. They worked for the Roman government. The Roman government oppressed the people of Israel during that time. And the tax collector would not only tax those who were Jewish, uh, but they were, they were known for taxing their people more, meaning they stole from their own people who were in the midst of being oppressed. They took advantage of the situation. Needless to say, tax collectors were detestable in the Jewish community. Their own community hated them and saw them as traitors. But in this parable, Jesus flips everyone's expectations on its head. The tax collector is so full of shame that he stands off by himself and he won't even look up to God. He's hanging his head and he's beating his chest, which was a sign of sorrow. And he pleads with God to show him mercy. God, show me mercy. He's crying out to God, asking God to withhold the wrath that he knows he deserves. I know we don't often think in terms like that, but if, if it weren't for Christ, there is a wrath for those who aren't in Christ. And we were at one point in our lives, like we were staring down the barrel of that wrath until we came to Christ. And so that's what this tax collector understands. He understands that only because of God, only God himself can show him mercy. And so in this moment, the tax collector is focused on himself. He's focused on his sin. He's focused on his need for God to forgive him. He blames no one else for his sin. He doesn't blame his circumstances. He makes no excuses. He just owns it. And he says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And in one commentary uh, on this passage, one of the things that it talks about is that actually uh, that article that's used there, a sinner, actually should be the sinner. So it should be translated, God, have mercy on me, the sinner. Much like Paul, like I am the sinner. I'm not focused on the sins of others. I'm focused on the sins of myself, the things that I have done. This image that Jesus ends the parable on 
Jesus concludes by saying this, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, who's the Pharisee, the tax collector went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. See, the point is that those who walk in humility will be poor in spirit and theirs will be the kingdom of heaven because they recognize the depth of their sin and their desperate need for Jesus every single day. Now, have we been forgiven of our sins? Yes. Do we experience joy and freedom from sin? Yes, absolutely. And we are still sinners. Whether it's lustful thoughts or a moment of anger or desire for things that are not ours, we're still sinners. Those who are poor in spirit have an increasing awareness of the ongoing struggle of the sin and frequency of sin in their lives. Those who are poor in spirit see themselves as utterly dependent on God and his grace for every single moment of their lives. For those who are poor in spirit, God has changed them so much that instead of complaining when adversity comes their way, they acknowledge that there's still much sin remaining in them and that God often uses adversity to expose the sin that's in their lives so that they may become more like Christ. And so for those of us who are growing in this area of being poor in spirit, what is it going to lead to? Well, it's gonna lead us to be more merciful. We show mercy because we have been shown mercy. God has withheld his wrath and said he took that wrath on himself. God took the wrath and placed it on his son and his son bore it on the cross. Now for us, as just human beings, mercy expresses itself in two different ways. Mercy seeks to, uh, to see the physical needs of others taken care of, and it also expresses itself when granting forgiveness to those who have sinned against us. You see, because when we realize the vastness of our sin, it creates in us empathy, compassion, patience towards other people and their sins. When we realize our own weakness our own, and our own dependence on Christ, it begins to shape the way that we see others. We begin to see the sins of other people differently. We recognize, okay, I might not be struggling with that particular sin, but I could be. And it's by the grace of God that I don't. Or maybe I used to struggle with that sin. And by God's grace, I don't as much anymore, but I'm going to love my brother or sister through this because God has done, done so with me. And it's my job to love them through these difficult circumstances. Or it might just be, hey, my... I, I just, I see my sin is way worse than what that person's got going on, but God has called me to help and to love that person, so I'm gonna be there for them. You see, when someone shares with us the sin that they're wrestling through, those who are poor in spirit, those who are merciful, instead of judging them, ask, how can I help? How can I be there for them? It's kind of like with younger children. When your kids were younger, you probably had to be a lot more patient with them, right? Or maybe not, I don't know. Hearts? What do you guys say? No? You still have to be really patient with them? Okay. Depends. <laughs> uh, you have to be patient, right, when you, ha when you have little kids or grandkids or little stepkids, um, whatever it might be. You have to be understanding because you could tell them not to do something, but they end up doing it anyway. Uh, we went through this with my, my wife's nephew, Levi. He's about three years old. He's, he's a really sweet boy. Everyone uh, in our family loves him. We have a text thread uh, that's called Team Lansky because that's my wife's maiden name. And so we text each other and that, picture, uh, that, that uh, text thread is just full of videos and pictures of Levi. That's like all that it is. Like very little conversation, just like, oh, look at what Levi's done today. And it's really, it's precious and it's cute. Um, but I remember that when he started walking and he started talking, he started going through this phase where uh, he would go up to electrical outlets and he would try to touch them. Now, because my uh, brother-in-law, my sister-in-law, uh, his parents, they're good parents, they, uh, they cover up all the electrical outlets, right, with the little plastic ones. We have a lot of them actually in the sanctuary right now. Uh, because they're good parents, a lot of those electrical sockets are covered. But he started figuring out very quickly that he could take them off and he would try to stick his finger in the electrical outlet. And I watched them, and I only would see them on weekends, and I watched them for just weekends on ends, be like, no, Levi, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. And like pulling them away from the electrical outlet, explaining to him why he shouldn't be doing that. And I, just the weekends that I was there and saw them do it was a ton. I mean, I'm not there during the week, but I imagine it's like six times that or whatever. And so 
it was really a really cool picture of they would, every time they did it, they never really got angry, they never really got frustrated, but they would do so lovingly. They would pull them aside and say, hey, here's why we don't want you to do that. That's not safe. That's harmful to you. And so why, why did he keep doing this? Why did he keep going to the electrical outlet even though his loving parents said, don't do that? Well, it's because he's a kid and he doesn't know any better. So his parents would have to patiently explain to him over and over and over again that this is not safe, this is not a good thing, this is bad. And what they had to do was be patient and loving and gracious. And they did it because they love him, because he's their son. And so in the same way as we recognize our own sinful condition, as we realize our need for Jesus and become poorer in spirit, the more merciful we'll be, the more gracious, the more empathetic, the more understanding, the more patient we'll be towards others as they wrestle through and struggle with their sin. Why? Because maybe that person doesn't know any better. Or maybe they are so entangled and wrapped up in their own sin that they just can't get out of it. And in the same breath, we also realize that even our smallest sin is still sin because we're all a work in progress. Yes, someone's, someone else's sin might seem more obvious to everybody, but the little sin that we wrestle with, that we struggle with, is still sin. As Paul says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single day we sin, we fall short of the glory of God. Not one of us is perfect. God has to be patient and merciful with us the same way he is patient and merciful with those who have sins that are obvious and egregious and terrible, or so we, so we think. So maybe we should show mercy rather than being judgmental. Maybe we should show mercy rather than be having a hard heart towards those who might be struggling with sin. Maybe we should be more merciful. And so this should be our posture as Christians. And Jesus uh, has, there's a, a story in the Bible where uh, Jesus actually shows what happens when we show mercy because what mercy actually does is lead towards the action of compassion. And so Matthew 9, 35, I love this story. It says, and Jesus went through all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogue, synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest uh, to send out laborers into the harvest. And so I love this story because out of mercy, Jesus came to the earth. Out of mercy, he went from city to village, town to town, proclaiming the gospel. Out of mercy, he was healing people uh, with afflictions and diseases and who had demons in them because he had compassion. These people were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And not only did he love them, but he showed his disciples what it means to be merciful towards those who are helpless. Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, and the, but the laborers are few. And what's cool is that in Acts 3, we actually see the disciples uh, do exactly what Jesus does in this story. In, in Acts chapter 3, verse 1, it says this, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us, which, by the way, was not common as men entered the temple. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them, but Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the hand and raised him up and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and, enter, and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had just happened to him. You see, in this moment, Peter and John showed mercy by providing physically and spiritually 
for this man. They did not see it as two different sides of the coin where when we show mercy, it's either, oh wait, I just need to help them with this physical need, right? They need help moving or hey, they have a, they have a baby on the way. We need to pr- provide a, a, a meal, you know, train and stuff like that. It's not just what they need physically. It's also what they need spiritually. And so what we see is these two disciples, after Jesus had ascended into heaven, going into the temple, seeing this lame bit, <clears throat> excuse me, this lame man, they walk up to him and they look him in the eyes and they help him up and they say, by the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. They performed this miracle in the name of Jesus because Jesus is the only one who has the power to heal physically and, 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 and provide for him materially, but also spiritually. And so this story gives us a beautiful picture of what it looks like for you and me to receive the mercy of God when, because when we are weak, we are made strong. When we receive God's mercy, it should cause us to stand up and leap and praise God. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever actually shown someone mercy, oftentimes their response is this. When they receive mercy that they don't deserve, it's incredible to watch. It's a blessing to be a part of that. And so the same is true for us when we show that type of mercy to others, when we give people the freedom and liberation from our judgment or our wrath or our condemnation that we put on others when they wrong us. Instead, we show them love. We show them mercy. Because God has shown us so much mercy every single day. And so I wanna just kind of conclude this morning with just a few thoughts. And here's the first one. What do we learn from this morning? First is you have to take responsibility for your sin. No more finger pointing, no more passing blame, no more yeah, but. Like if there's one thing I've learned in two and a half years of marriage, it's that you don't, don't point to your spouse and say, yeah, but you did that, right? Those are like, you're dead man walking if you do that. Don't blame your sin on your spouse. You messed up. Just own your sin. And all you can do is just hope and pray that God, if they have sinned, that God will reveal that sin in them as well. So no more finger pointing, no more passing blame, no more, yeah, but my sin falls on me. Your sin falls on you. Our sin should cause us to look inward and it should cause us to look upward because that's where mercy comes from, is only from God. Yes, Jesus can and will forgive you if you believe in him. Yes, you will have the church to help you and support you as you try to overcome the sin in your life. But being poor in spirit means taking responsibility for your thoughts, your words, your actions. And it means humbly going before God and asking him to show you mercy every single day. Lastly, God's mercy will change your life and the life of those around you. Like if you're holding on to a grudge right now, if you are holding against somebody right now. As my brother always reminds me, like that only hurts you, that only harms you. And yes, that is true, but it also harms others when you carry that grudge and that hurt towards somebody. It's amazing how not only you, like how your life changes and how the lives of those around you change when you show mercy to somebody. It's a beautiful thing. It impacts not just you, but those in your circles. And so mercy leads us towards the action of compassion. The sin of others should not cause us to become prideful, right? Like the Pharisee. It should not cause us to look down on others like the Pharisee. The sins of others should break our heart. And instead, in the name of Jesus, we should strive to be merciful towards them and help them, whether it's a physical need or it's a spiritual need. And oftentimes, you know what? All the time, pretty much, it's both. So where are some areas in your life where you might need to take responsibility for your sin, whether it's in thoughts, words, or actions? Who are some people in your life that need the type of mercy that Jesus has shown us? I wanna end with this quote from James Boyce. He's a 20th century pastor and theologian. He's, his commentaries are just incredible. Uh, I, he's a, an incredible pastor. He's passed away now, but he was incredible. He wrote this, and I want want us to end with this thought. He said, never plead your merits before God. 
plead mercy. It is mercy we need. We need it from first to last. We need it every single day. That is the posture we are to walk in as Christians every single day. Let's pray. God, we uh, just thank you for this opportunity to open your word and to learn from your word. God, you say, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. You say, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. God, we just thank you so much that that is the case. We thank you that these transformative truths are showing us what it looks like to be a son and daughter in your kingdom. And God, help us to not only apply those here in the church or in our life groups or wherever we serve, but God, help us to apply these truths in our marriages with our children, with our grandchildren, with those that we interact with on a daily basis, God. Please, please, please help us as we strive to be poor in spirit and as we strive to be more merciful. We love you, God. We love you, Jesus. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us? I 
sins they are many his mercy is more well, amen thanks for being with us this morning have a great week and we'll see you next sunday